Lesson 8. Tapas. You know tapas? Let's go to the tapas bar. <laughs> tapas is Spanish. Food, very delicious. But this is not Spanish language. It's kind of the opposite. <laughs> tapas is austerity, the practice of austerity. Now you see in the handout, this very emaciated yogi, the third illustration on the right side, that is an extreme example of austerity. There are these, uh, there are these sects in India of yogis who live deep inside the forest, who renounce all worldly luxury. They, um, they eat very austere. They um, just water and, and what they can find in the forest, grass, roots, very austere. And they push it to very extreme levels. There is an interesting anecdote about um, Gautama the Buddha. Gautama the Buddha was a prince. He was the son of royal family. And Gautama, Prince Gautama, um, he had an inclination towards spirituality. He felt naturally inclined towards spirituality. And he came to the conclusion that living in the comfort and the luxury of the palace, the royal palace, was, was blocking his development as a spiritual person. So the story goes that he was actually engaged to get married as a young lad, but instead of getting married, he, the night before the wedding, so the story goes, he left the palace through a secret underpass, a secret tunnel. All castles and palaces in the past had secret tunnels to escape in case of danger. So he left the palace and he joined a, a sect of fakirs. Have you ever heard of Fakir? Fakir is this kind of guy. People who practice extreme austerity. So he joined the community of Fakirs deep inside the forest. He threw away his clothes and um, was dressed only with a loincloth. And in pursuit of spirituality, um, eating just grass and, and, and pure water. The reason why people do this is because austerity leads to energy, increasing energy and energy rising up. That is why not only the fakirs, but also monks, Christian monks in, in, the, in the monasteries in Europe and, and Buddhist monks, they tend to live very austere lives. No luxury. Also when it comes to food. Not as extreme as the fakirs, but it's a general principle. The thing is, and the interesting part of the story is, that after six years living in this fakir community he was he felt that he was dying he had pushed austerity so far that his body was completely malnourished 
and he felt that his organs were starting to fail. His heart, his kidneys, his liver, everything started to hurt and, and what have you. So he came to the conclusion that, yes, living in the luxury and comfort of the palace, that is not really inducive to spirituality, but this also doesn't work. This is just too extreme and I'm about to die, so what is the use of all this? So he decided to leave also the fakirs. And his conclusion was, of course, the golden mean of the Buddha. The golden mean of the Buddha means you have to find a middle way. A middle way between the luxury and the extreme austerity. Neither of them worked. But a combination of the two, or a, a, a fine-tuned balance between the two, is in the end is the answer. That, that is his famous conclusion. He left the forest. The story goes that he came across a goat. For the first time in a long time, he drank milk, which is a very nourishing drink, very nutritious. He drank milk for the first time in, in six years. And he slowly started to recover and ended up sitting under his famous tree. So austerity is something that you have to approach based, of course, on non-violence, non-lying, non-stealing, also non-desire. Your desire for spirituality can make you push yourself so far that you end up malnourishing yourself and almost dying. So, austerity is important because a human being, we are an organic system that needs stimulation to function properly. If we don't move, if our body is not challenged, under pressure from, from activities, our body stops functioning properly. Our energy household starts to deteriorate. You can see with people around you, in your family, in your neighborhood, people who are inactive, they become quickly unhealthy. And for us, there is an, an extra element here. Spirituality is not possible without energy. The crown chakra, where your intuition, wisdom, vision, deep insight are all located, requires large amounts of energy. So if your energy household is poor, any spiritual endeavor is destined to fail. Just reading books yoga books or Bible or Quran doesn't make you spiritual. You can maybe learn something from it, pick up something from it, without pro properly processing it and putting it into practice. Because for that, you need energy, and not just energy, energy that fuels the crown chakra. So the physical body, you can see it like this. The essence of the human being is energy. Energy is spirit or soul. But your soul has descended and lives in a physical body that requires maintenance, like a car requires maintenance. If a car is not regularly driven and maintained with new oil filters and 
refreshed oil and what have you, good quality gasoline and what have you, the car will just start to fall apart with time. And a human being is no different. No, in the Netherlands, well, these days everybody goes to the gas station and goes through the, the, laundra the laundrette, or what, what do you call it? In the past, those were rare, and people just tended to work all week, and Saturday, all the neighbors came down with a bucket of water and started to wash their cars. People tended to take better care of their cars in my neighborhood than they would take care of themselves. Really true. People do not realize how important it is to take care of themselves but they do take care and spend a lot of money on their car. What is austerity? It starts with your asana practice. Why do you do all these difficult things? Why would any sane person do all these difficult things? Isn't it just more comfortable to stay at home at the sofa with your smart gadgets around you or watching TV or so. Yeah, that's nice sometimes. But there is a reason why yoga has a physical element. Not just meditation, not just studying the philosophy. Asana is an important element. You subject yourself to discomfort in order to be more comfortable. Does that make sense? Because when you're unhealthy, automatically you become uncomfortable too. The healthier you are, the more comfortable you feel in your skin. That is why asana is sukham and stira. It's easy and straight even with a pretzel pose, even with an advanced pose. If you are in a good condition, it's easy and it is straight. Of course, if you're not in a good condition, you suffer a lot when you try these kind of things. So, austerity, when you practice asana, and you kind of feel resistance and you ask yourself, why the hell am I doing all these difficult things? It's easier to just relax. Then you remind yourself of the subject of austerity, the importance of doing maintenance to the organic body that you are, because it will start falling apart. Not only that, the pursuit of spirituality simply is not possible without austerity and you remind yourself of course of the principle of non-violence austerity only works if it doesn't damage you if it doesn't harm you and we live in a very challenging time because in the past life was austere because we didn't have washing machines, we didn't have cars, motorcycles, trains, airplanes, elevators. We had to do everything physically. But now everything is done by machines, by technology. And we need to have a certain discipline to avoid getting trapped into the comfort of all those luxuries. If you live on the third floor of a flat with an elevator, many people take the elevator. Practice of austerity means that you choose to take the stairs. Of course, if you live on the 12th floor, if you're a little bit extreme, you can take the stairs 
but it makes sense that you take the elevator. But if you live on the third floor, fourth floor, just use it as a tool. You don't have to go to the gym. Just walk the stairs. You know, I live, I live in an apartment complex that it's pretty big. It has 24 flats, 24 domes, <laughs> but it's not much longer than 700 meter. Say it's 700 meter long and 500 meter wide. And you know, in Korea, when you are living in an apartment, you have a sticker on your window that gives you access to the parking lot. I live in the first flat, Yu Dong, first dome, which is the beginning of the apartment. And there are many amenities there. There are two kindergartens, the maintenance office is there, the block heating, all the, all the, uh, the, the, the management office is there, and there is a church. So there's a lot of traffic there, a lot of people needing to go there. And I live there and I observe what is happening. And there are people with a sticker of our apartment on their window, which means they don't live farther away than 700 meters, who drop their children off at school by car. Apart from the fact that it sets a very bad example for your child, your child would be happy to ride a bicycle to school or to walk and just look at the trees and the birds and the other kids walking to school. But people drop off their kid. Less than 700 meters, they take a car. And same with the church. People come to church from the other side of the apartment by car. And already we have a parking problem. Austerity means that you choose to walk if it's reasonable. <laughs> you know, I have two dogs and so there's a dog community on the riverside and um, there is a, behind the 63 building is, a, is, a, is an apartment building called Ricentia. And in bird's eye, in bird's flight, that is less than 500 meter away from the riverside, there is a dog owner there who goes with his dog to the basement, gets into his car, comes out of the parking lot, goes into the parking lot of the riverside park to walk his dog. So I asked why, why it actually takes longer to get to the field where the dogs gather if you go by car than when you walk. You know what he said? You know, people are smoking in the street and I hate to walk to go through the smoke. It's kind of, you know, your dog wants to walk, wants to sniff around and another dog peed there and he wants to know that. He wants to, dogs look through their nose. They, they understand the world around them through their nose. They need to sniff around. Very strange. Anyway, austerity means that you, that you choose deliberately, if reasonable, that you just rely on your physical strength to do things. And you have your guardrails in the form of the yamas. Especially non-violence comes into play here. You see in the very first paragraph, austerity is the continu continuation of the practice of contentment. Tapas or austerity is a matter of being content, keeping a sense of satisfaction, even when you find yourself in difficult situations. That is crucial. What is this about? It's about attitude. It's about staying calm and controlled, regardless of the situation, in spite of the challenge or the difficulties that you are facing. Remember at the very beginning, in the workshop or lesson one, I explained that most people lose 
valuable energy, most energy, through mental activity, subconscious mental activity. When we find ourselves facing difficulties, we get stressed. Stress is a huge consumer of energy, which could better be spent on dealing with the issue at hand. But how do we avoid stress? You avoid stress by practicing contentment, by practicing austerity. Instead of seeing life through the lens of comfort and difficulty, you start seeing difficult situations as challenges. Challenges that are there to be overcome. Because you know that challenges lead you to further development. Because you know that nothing can be achieved without challenges. Contentment means positive thought, seeing the glass as half full rather than half empty, seeing challenges as good things rather than bad things. It is mental austerity. It is control of attitude and it saves you huge amounts of energy which people subconsciously waste all the time, day in, day out, all day long, because of uncontrolled mental activity, impulsive actions and reactions towards situations that just occur in daily life, simple every daily life situations. One of the big secrets in yoga really is about control of attitude. It's something that you don't learn in a basic course, but I teach you that anyway because it is so simple and so effective. In the advanced course we go very deep into that. But in, when we study the chakras, I will come back to it also a little bit because we then deal with Manipura chakra. So we will come back to that. But attitude. Stay calm and controlled regardless of the situation you are facing. And it will enable you to, to deal efficiently and effectively with the situation at hand. If you find that difficult, it starts with your asana practice. You do a warrior pose, you bend one leg, and you, you feel the pressure. The first thing that happens after staying in the pose a little while is that you become stressed. Oh my God, when can I stop doing this difficult thing? <laughs> you feel the pressure. As a yoga practitioner, you try to avoid that. Austerity means to stay calm and controlled as long as you can reasonably handle it. And you practice that, you put that into practice starting with your asana. You stay in the pose as long as you can, but when it gets too hard, too difficult, you must know when to stop. But laziness doesn't get you anywhere. You do not use your yoga philosophy as an excuse for laziness. We came to that conclusion in the previous session studying about contentment. So you do what you can, honestly. All the yamas apply here. If you're not honest with yourself and you find an excuse in, in your philosophy to, to cut corners, you're also stealing the opportunity to grow. It's all related. So you do the best that you can, but you also, you're very honest, non-violent, you know when it is time to stop. Over time you will see that you expand, that you can stay longer, comfortably. In the beginning, when the condition is not so good yet, you just have to stop in time, knowing that you did what you could, so you're not denying yourself, further development, also not causing uh, uh, 
muscle ache or torn muscles or um, grave discomfort. Because the goal of all this is in the end sattva. If you stay too long in the pose, you overshoot the goal and you end up in a rajas uh, condition that is accompanied by mental restlessness. It's very difficult to meditate. Meditation always comes after your asana practice. You will notice when you practice asana too hard, your meditation is not going anywhere. Because rajas causes your mind to be very restless and scattered. On the other hand, when your asana practice is balanced, you do the effort, but you don't overshoot the goal. You sit on your cushion, and meditation actually comes very naturally. Because you're relatively sattvic. You can compare the early session with the late session. The early session is kind of rajas, with all these standing poses. The second session is much more sattvic. We finish with three, four variations of the shoulder stand. And then we sit on the cushion after Savasana. And you very naturally float into, drift off into a very nice uh, trance-like concentration, meditation. It's important that you pay attention to these kind of differences. If you can manage to do, apply this in your asana practice, it will naturally integrate into daily life situations. And I dare say that as a yoga practitioner, you wouldn't think of taking the car to drop off your child to a place 500 meters down the road. Because Yoga practitioners generally possess what is called common sense, because that comes with the transformation. The common sense, I always make the joke about common sense, that is actually not so common. <laughs> so many people are lacking common sense, truly. There's a little bit of a funny name to call it common sense. In Dutch we call it the, the Dutch translation for common sense is logic, which makes more sense. <laughs> logic, because it doesn't, it doesn't, common sense says that it's common, <laughs> meaning that many people possess it, and the reality is it seems not so. But when you use the word logic, it doesn't say anything about how many people that actually possess as a quality. Now, so, talking about austerity, it seems like the fakirs, it seems that luxury and comfort is detrimental to, uh, to being a yogi and to your spiritual development. But that is not true. And the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, in the first chapter, is very clear about that. And we will we will read that we will read that in um, in a couple of weeks. A certain level of comfort is in fact necessary for spiritual development. You have to have a regular food supply. You have to have a comfortable place that is free from dangers, either from nature or from people. It has to be relatively comfortable, warm inside when it's cold out, and if you can afford it, equipped with an air conditioner in case it gets really hot. Why is this important? If you are distracted by surviving or by discomfort, 
the pursuit of spirituality is simply not possible. There needs to be a certain material foundation that allows you to pursue spirituality. So that is important to keep in mind. Austerity is important, but that does not mean to deny ourselves uh, stable and relatively comfortable living conditions, because without those, your pursuit of spirituality, your yoga practice, is doomed to fail. Try, try to see challenges in life as a form of training. Try to approach uh, changing work circumstances, for example, or um, when you move, and you have to. Um, you have to pack everything and unpack everything and organize and reorganize and, and uh, adapt to a whole new situation. Um, try to see these kind of challenges more as a positive element, as, as uh, situations and, 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 and activities that actually um, help you to grow, to evolve, to learn also. If you approach it in that way, when we, when we see challenges or changes as a burden, it immediately has a negative effect on our energy household. We become stressed, we become uh, depressed, we become uh, pessimistic, we complain, we grumble, all kinds of elements that destroy our most precious asset, which is energy. But if you turn it around and you, you see challenges as a form of training, you have a positive attitude towards it and instead of destroying your energy, it builds your energy. Austerity leads to strength. Strength equals energy. The more strength you have, the more energy you possess. So one does not go without the other. When you deal with difficult situations, you remind yourself of this. That in the end, in spite of the difficulties that you're facing, it only has positive results. It only has benefits. And being able to deal with difficult situations and challenges in this way, consciously, is incredibly empowering. To make a sport of the practice of austerity in all its aspects, in daily lives, in relationships, etc. Work is a big part of people's life, of course. Questions? You see that at the end of most of many of the files, there is a little section on 
Tarana, meditation, or nada. I always ask you if you hear nada. Um, we're now in the fourth, this is the fourth Sunday, so um, if you do not hear nada yet, there is, there is a technique that you can replace it with. So, so far we have approached this 15 minutes of nada, uh, a kind of freewheeling, observing. But that is only the very first step on the path towards meditation. Because meditation is only possible through mind control. So after observing, you need to canalize your thought processes towards nada, one-pointed focus. You need an object on which you concentrate. Our object of concentration is nada, will be nada. Not everybody hears it yet. So how do you deal with that in case you cannot hear it yet? You push with your finger between your eyebrows here. Indian people often have a red spot painted here, sometimes even tattooed here. It's called the third eye. And um, I don't know if it's anatomically correct, but they say that this spot here is connected with the center of the head where nada is projected. Then some of the sutras in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika also tell you to turn your eyes towards the center between the eyebrows. You don't do that literally. It's about focusing here. If you cannot hear nada yet, one finger, push hard so that you, when you take your finger away, you still feel that pressure. And you concentrate on that feeling between your eyebrows. It, it really helps you to concentrate, to remember the principle of a laser beam, concentrated energy, that is what you do when you mentally concentrate. And you do that on nada, if nada is not there, you do that on the center of the eye, between the eyebrows. And it's very likely, if you do so, that nada will come very soon. Okay. No questions? Let's have a short break then. Before we start with Prasanna.